Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I am Chris Short, uh, despite what it says in the window. I'm the Principal Product Marketing Manager at Ansible. Uh, today, we're talking about uh, Kubernetes operators and building them with Ansible. Uh, I will be handing it off to Tim Apnell, who will graciously introduce himself if you have questions, please type them into the questions block in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, I will be fielding some and tossing them over to Tim, who will answer them at the end. There'll be time at the end where Tim will circle back. Uh, if you have any issues with your connection, uh, the only thing I can tell you to do is reconnect. Uh, if Tim has issues, I will jump in uh, and wait for Tim to come back graciously unless he tells me to continue without him. All right. Without further ado, Tim Apnell, Senior Product Marketer, Senior Product Manager at Ansible. Great, thanks, Chris. Yeah, and I, hello everyone. This is Tim. Uh, I'm going to be taking you through this deck today. Uh, just a little background on me, if you're you're not familiar with me. I'm a longtime Ansible uh, person. I've uh, worked in a number of different capacities, from contributor to customer to consultant, and now product manager. Uh, with the Ansible team, and more recently, um, um, as as a as a product evangelist, been picking up uh, and talking about how you can bring Ansible and Kubernetes together, which is what this talk is going to be about. So let's uh, dive right in, and uh, let's start right away with uh, what we're going to. Uh, what's the topic of this presentation, and what we're setting out to demonstrate right up front. Uh, so, so on this topic, you know, operators help simplify the deployment management and the operation of complex applications on Kubernetes and on, and on OpenShift, which is a form of Kubernetes, uh, our, our, our uh, enterprise class product. And uh, typically these operators are, are, are written in Go uh, by software developers that are highly familiar with Kubernetes and its internals and its API. Uh, what we're going to be talking about here is that you can create Ansible-based operators and they provide a lower barrier to entry and you can iterate on them faster and they're easier to manage. And uh, they bring the whole power of Ansible and its ecosystem to bear. So right now that might, this doesn't possibly make a lot of sense at the moment and it's going to raise a lot of questions, but these are going to be questions that we're going to answer through this presentation. I just want to put that out there up front. What's what this is all about um, as we move into uh, what we're going to talk about and and uh, you know things like what does Kubernetes help you do is these type of foundational things you need to understand to to, under, to get to bringing Ansible and Kubernetes together uh, what what are operators and why are they needed and you know, you know why would you want to build an operator with Ansible so you know how how do I use Ansible to automate all this activity on my cluster? So, like I said, before we get into operators and talking about Ansible, we need to cover some foundational concepts uh, so that we can understand and fully realize the purpose and the value of Kubernetes and operators and Ansible. So, what is Kubernetes? It's a platform designed to completely manage the life cycle of containerized applications and services using methods that are, are predictable and, uh, and, and support scalability and high availability. They, it's, it's, it's really about uh, microservice architectures here. Uh, you know, Kubernetes came, uh, it was, was a platform that was first developed by Google. Uh, it was open sourced. Red Hat has has been the second biggest contributor to Kubernetes since it was open source. Uh, it's, it was later donated to the cloud native uh, computing foundation, the CNCF, who who now uh, uh, steward it. Uh, and it's not the only option for container management, but it has rapidly become uh, one of the most popular open source projects out there, and and it really has become the uh, de facto standard for uh, managing containerized applications, orchestrating containerized applications. So what Kubernetes helps you do, as a, as a Kubernetes user, you can uh, define how your application should run and the ways that 
Uh, they should interact with other applications, other services inside the cluster, and even the outside world. So it gives you the ability to scale your services up and down, uh, perform you know, things like graceful rolling updates, uh, uh, manage the traffic, switch it uh, uh, to, to you know, what versions of a container or an application that you're using and, and handle things like uh, uh, rollbacks and manage uh, uh, volumes, resources like that in your application. So Kubernetes is very powerful in helping you do all these web scale type of operational tasks and uh, um, um, functions. Kubernetes does this by providing interfaces and, and, and creating, it, it provides these composable uh, objects that are referred to as primitives that allow you to define and manage your applications and automate a lot of those operational tasks with a, a, a high degree of flexibility and power and reliability. Uh, here on the screen, I have a list of the most common objects that Kubernetes implements. It's by no means a, uh, a complete list of everything there, uh, but it is the ones that you will, uh, as you work with Kubernetes, you'll find yourself um, um, working with often. And uh, you work with these objects through the Kubernetes API. It's a RESTful API that's part of the control plane and the, and, and the manager of your cluster. Uh, so these, um, Kubernetes use these objects to represent the state of your cluster. Uh, they work as a record of intent so that uh, what happens is, is you create an object and, and state what, uh, what state you want it to be. And then Kubernetes works to ensure that uh, the object exists and then it will uh, work to achieve that state. So you're, you're saying, here's what I want the world to look like, and then Kubernetes goes about uh, making that happen. So this is, should be very familiar to people in Ansible because it's a desired state engine, much like Ansible itself. So while it's possible to do many of these type of things that you see here um, um, in your application itself, uh, these tend to be in, uh, previously, traditionally, uh, things that you would do that would happen one off in a single application. Sometimes they're brittle because the application itself, that's not its main focus or, uh, or expertise is to handle things of scale and high availability. Uh, so what Kubernetes brings in and, and, and helps you do better is to have this separation of concerns where the orchestration of your application, the scaling and the availability and, and, and how it all comes together uh, is, is separated out so you can focus on uh, your application and the code that makes up that application and makes it run. All right. So when you create an object in Kubernetes, uh, you provide with an object spec and that describes its desired state. Um, in addition to some of this um, metadata, things of that nature, like the name and labels and things like that. Uh, uh, so when you use the Kubernetes API to create an object, whether it's you're, you're calling the API directly yourself or you're using um, some other tool, a very common one is the, the cube control command line tool. Um, that request has to go to the API service as JSON in the request body. But most often you'll provide that information uh, as YAML. Uh, that's the way that Cube Control uh, consumes these specs. Uh, it's just YAML is much easier, as we all know being Ansible people, it's just much easier to uh, write and read as humans. So then Cube Control converts that YAML information to JSON and passes that on to the API. Um, here I have on the screen an example of the YAML file that shows um, uh, some basic spec, object specs on uh, a Kubernetes pod and a Kubernetes service. So another um, relatively new feature to Kubernetes and a very important one um, is a, a custom resource definition or CRD. Um, it's a 
powerful feature that was introduced that enables users to add their own custom objects to the Kubernetes cluster and use it like any other native Kubernetes object that's built in. As we'll see a, a little bit later, uh, CRDs are, are, are integral to um, operators. So once we have a CRD uh, or, or an, in the Kubernetes API, uh, it becomes a resource and an endpoint that can store the, uh, a collection of objects of that kind. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, we have a built-in pod resource that contains a lot of pod objects. Uh, a CRD comes in when we want to introduce our own object. Uh, it might be like a memcache object, for example, that we'll look at in a little bit. And uh, um, it allows us then to fill out our requirements and, and to work with that um, custom resource directly ourselves, whether that's through the API itself or, the, or CLI. And the custom resource can plug into all the primitive objects to make use of what Kubernetes ships with. So um, once a custom resource is created, it's, it's stored in the GetCD cluster where, where all the key value pairs and information and state of Kubernetes resides, uh, you know, with all the proper replication and lifecycle management happening there for you. Um, and it allows us to use all the functionalities provided the, to the Kubernetes cluster uh, on our custom object and saves us all that overhead of implementing our own um, you know, a, API service and, and, and whatnot. So that covers just the foundational background on, on Kubernetes itself. Uh, now let's start to talk a little bit about how uh, Ansible and Kubernetes are a natural fit together. Uh, as you see, there's a lot of similarities to how Kubernetes and Ansible approach their individual problem domains that, uh, that really make it a natural fit to uh, when you bring the two of them together. They both have uh, you know, highly uh, active and widely used, uh, uh, well, they are, I should say, highly active and widely used open source projects. And they have very vibrant communities, very active uh, ecosystems that are out there um, um, working on these and, 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 and uh, furthering along what the capabilities of the software are, uh, can do. Uh, they, they, they're generally focused on uh, making hard things easier through this automation and orchestration. Uh, and they both work as desired state engines, as I've already, already covered. And they also make extensive use of YAML. As we can see from these two examples, uh, both use similar patterns in YAML to describe the desired state of the world. So on the left, you have a Kubernetes uh, config map object definition that's expressed in YAML. Uh, you could feed this into your cluster using cube control. Uh, on the right, then, you have a, a, a single Ansible task here using the Kates module, which we're going to talk about a lot, uh, doing the same thing. As you notice, they're almost identical. If you look at what's on the left, and then you look at what's on the right in red, there's a, Ansible only adds a, a little bit of extra uh, syntactic sugar in order to do the same thing. Uh, now, one of the things that we're, that, that, uh, uh, that it's small but significant here, is if you look down at the color parameter on the, uh, in the Ansible task, you'll see that we're making use of Ansible's built-in Jinja2 template functionality. Templating is not something that Cube Control um, supports. So by running this through Ansible, we're able to templatize the uh, object specs that we're feeding into our Kubernetes um, um, cluster and control plane. So what's, what's the most powerful part of using Ansible is just how easy it is to interact with Kubernetes, whether you're developing an operator or you're automating something else in your, your cluster. That's the one takeaway you should get from this, uh, even if it's not specifically uh, about developing operators. Um, so the, the Kates module is uh, uh, highly capable. You're able to work with anything in the API. And there's also some other supporting Kates modules uh, um, in addition to the, the, the main one that we'll be looking at a lot here. Um, 
one other thing of note I wanted to make here is that in the last example, we saw that uh, there's in the, in the Ansible task and the, the inline config map definition had one parameter that was templatized. What you can actually do is use the full power of Ansible to uh, take that one step further and maintain the entire definition as a separate Ginger2 file uh, like you see here in this example. So here we, uh, we have foo.yaml, which is presumably a Ginger2 template. Uh, uh, by using this one line, we read that file in and then feed it uh, into the Kates module, which then talks to the Kates API on our cluster and does all the variable substitution and, and all the things we're used to um, doing inside of Ansible with Jinja2. Okay, let's start talking about operators and their value. Um, so with Kubernetes, you get a lot of powerful functionality that makes it relatively easy to manage and scale web apps, so mobile backgrounds, API services right out of the box, uh, you know, because these applications are generally stateless. So the basics of the basic Kubernetes functionality in the API is like deployments, they can scale and recover from failure without any specific knowledge. If something fails, they just, um, and, and the, the, the reality of the, the cluster doesn't match the desired state of the cluster, Kubernetes has the uh, uh, baseline functionality to get it back into state. You know, if we have a node die, it can redeploy pods to uh, other nodes that are healthy. Or, or if a pod dies, it can do the same sort of thing. Or if there's a scaling event, it knows it can roll out more pods. Thing is, is that uh, you know, stateless is easy, stateful is hard. Uh, you know, when, the, when the operator community uh, came to this idea, uh, it, you know, then, and they saw that the stateless applications was a pretty straightforward proposition inside of Ansible. Uh, then we quickly got to more advanced and stateful distributed systems on Kubernetes. There started to be this this gap. So it was it was great that you know there there uh, there were these these primitives, but there there weren't um, the primitives weren't that were built into Kubernetes weren't meant to deal with managing these type of applications that were more uh, advanced and, and, and stateful. So uh, they required some type of application domain to uh, and, and knowledge to and expertise to uh, correctly scale them, upgrade them, reconfigure them, um, you know, and do things like protect them, uh, protect the applications from any type of data loss or, or, or uh, availability issues. So this is where the uh, operators entered the picture and where the idea came from. So operators uh, automate and simplify the management of complex applications on Kubernetes. They're uh, an application specific controller that runs inside of Kubernetes that extends the Kubernetes API to be able to create, configure and manage instances of these uh, complex stateful applications on behalf of the Kubernetes user. Uh, it, the, the operators build on the same basic Kubernetes resources and controller concepts, but they bring uh, you know, domain and application specific knowledge to automate these common tasks right on the cluster in a Kubernetes native way. So operators enable you, uh, you to program the smarts that Kubernetes needs to effectively manage your uh, um, complex stateful application. So let's talk a little more about you know, some scenarios here of why that's really important. Let's say you're running Prometheus as many organizations are today. We know that's another one of the CNCF uh, um, blessed projects for uh, collecting uh, and reporting metrics on what's happening inside of Kubernetes. Um, so a lot of organizations are running Prometheus. And let's say you're running it on several instances against production deployments. You're, you're probably not gonna check on those uh, manually. And you're gonna probably set up a monitoring tool of some type, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, there's so many that you, you could use to monitor what's happening on Prometheus. So, you know, what happens is if there is a problem, the tool uh, will alert you, 
And then at that point, uh, you have to, the, a human has to come in to do some manual intervention. And you know, the, the, that human has to come in and check on you know, what, what the best practices are and you know, make any necessary changes or, or adjustments, uh, then confirm that the change worked. And this could take several minutes. It could even take hours, depending on what time of the, the day or night this issue happened. So in contrast, we have operators that are running on the Kubernetes cluster as, uh, as a controller, then they're continuously checking the system status against the desired state and can respond within milliseconds to restore that desired state. So this is, uh, operators are freeing up your team to perform more value-added tasks and they're just delivering a higher level of service uh, um, and, and, and helping uh, remediate any type of problems that could occur on your cluster. So the operator uh, being something running in the cluster itself and, and monitoring what's happening can execute these actions automatically uh, based on the state of your system um, and you know, revert you back to the desired state very quickly. So that's the value of operators. Let's take a look at the operator pa uh, pattern here. Uh, really, operators are, as, as I've already uh, mentioned, a type of controller application that's running in your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, what's happening is, is that it is uh, watching for events that happen inside of your cluster and responding to those events. So an operator is always looking at uh, what's been specified as the desired state of the world through the, 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 the case API that was uh, created by the, the custom resource definition. And then it'll make changes to the cluster to uh, uh, bring it to what had been specified. So this is a process called reconciliation. Um, so as we've previously discussed in an operator, um, you know, is this controller, it's been purpose built to deploy and automate what's happening in the Kubernetes uh, application. Um, so whatever kinds of workloads you need to deploy into Kubernetes, uh, you can automate with this operator pattern. And it, it's designed to capture um, and encode this human operational knowledge so that anything that a human administrator, meaning a, a system engineer or an ops person, need to do to maintain and keep the application or service running in a cluster can be uh, um, you know, encoded into uh, this piece of software that runs on the cluster itself and, and works in, in real time. So this concept of the operator, we have the, the operator framework, and that consists of three parts that are, um, they're all designed to provide this streamlined and uniform way of, of writing and managing operators. Um, and I should mention in, uh, that operators are, can be deployed on any Kubernetes cluster, not just OpenShift. Uh, uh, in fact, the operators themselves are, are using uh, primitive objects and native Kubernetes functionality. There are no special libraries that you need to install to your Kubernetes cluster itself in order to make use of operators. So it's a very important thing to, to keep in mind as you're you're, you're following this. So uh, back to the operator uh, framework, there are three parts. The operator SDK, uh, and which makes it easy to build or modify operators for your organization. Um, and, and, you know, it just is a, a, a toolkit to make building these things much easier. Uh, this is where we're gonna be spending the, 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 uh, the rest of this presentation on and what we're, we're actually here talking about. Uh, spe specifically the Ansible parts of this SDK. Uh, the other parts uh, I just want to make you aware of and spend a, just a couple seconds on here is the operator lifecycle management of the OEM, uh, OLM. Um, th this is uh, a tool that's there to manage the life cycles of the operators going into your system, uh, onto your cluster, I should say. And uh, they help you do things like, uh, you know, install operators and, and, and deal with managing permissions and, and dependencies and things like that. Another part of the operator framework is operator uh, metering. 
Uh, this, this is part of the framework, gives admins insight into the usage of specific operators um, and uh, you know, lets you watch custom resources, collect data, perform calculations, report you know, all that back to the administrator. So this is very useful for uh, um, enterprises that might need this data for, let's say, chargebacks or, or maybe a service provider who wants to um, um, see which customers are using what. That's where the uh, operator meeting comes in. All right, so let's move on to um, you know how how can Ansible be applied here to all this? We've we've talked about Kubernetes, we've talked about operators, we've talked about how Ansible and Kubernetes are a natural fit together. But let's let's you know why why should you build an operator with Ansible and what is the value to doing so? So in Working through the the operator concept, uh, the, the 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 team that's worked on the operator SDK added the ability to use Ansible. So we have the Ansible operator SDK now uh, that makes it easier to deploy and manage Kubernetes apps in a native with native Ansible support. Uh, what we do, you know, what I should uh, make clear is that this is not an add-on to the operator SDK. This is Ansible is a first class citizen of the operator SDK. If you've installed the operator SDK, you have the ability to uh, develop operators inside of Ansible. Uh, Ansible is one of three types of operators that the SDK supports natively uh, as of the fall of last year. Uh, Golang is the original way that people um, have developed operators, which is how Kubernetes itself is developed in Golang. Uh, the SDK also supports uh, Helm if you have Helm charts, but we're here to talk about Ansible. This is an Ansible webinar, and that's what we're gonna be talking uh, about from here on out. Um, so what happens is, is that you, you build your code on top of this uh, uh, provided base image that, and um, along with some metadata to map things together and then build a uh, container image that you put into Kubernetes. And we're gonna be going into a lot more detail on that here in just a moment. But first, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, why, what's the value that, that developing these operators in Ansible bring uh, as opposed to other, other forms, whether it's you know, using one of the other uh, operator SDK types or even um, you know, just building your own from, um, just using the operator pattern and building everything without the operator SDK. Um, so Ansible, is, you know, we're, we're on an Ansible webinar, so I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with Ansible and know that it can be ridiculously simple to learn um, and that new users can uh, learn the required structures in hours versus days and weeks, doesn't you know, require uh, uh, programming, things of that nature. So if you're already developing Ansible modules and roles, your skills are transferable here to building uh, operators and automation for Kubernetes applications. Uh, so the, the Ansible SDK provides this abstraction layer and helps um, um, significantly reduce the, the, the Kubernetes API experience you need to get things done. So uh, you know, as we've, we've talked about that Ansible and Kubernetes are a natural fit together. They're both using YAML to describe desired state of the world. And um, you know, th there's this great community, this vibrant community and, and ecosystem out there to solve these problems here. So you can use the same tried and trusted uh, tooling um, to make this happen, uh, particularly with the, uh, with the addition of the Kates module to uh, Ansible. So as I, as I mentioned already, there are other uh, um, types of uh, operators that, that, that the, the operator SDK supports. Uh, Ansible operators, this, what this is chart is showing is that Ansible operators, unlike the Helm-based ones and just like the Go-based operators, uh, can be used to manage the complete lifecycle of a container-based application inside a Kubernetes uh, cluster. Um, and Ansible enables the full featured operators to be developed. Uh, arguably, you're not giving up anything using Ansible as opposed to Golang. And in some respects, as, a, as I'll cover, you, you kind of gain a lot of efficiencies 
with, with, with Golang, um, you get that fine grain control and the power and raw performance, uh, but there's quite a few advanced and complex concepts in, involved in doing so, and not every uh, person has that expertise and uh, not every enterprise has those resources. Uh, and you know, the, there's, so anyway, there's a lot of, of um, generic and boilerplate functions that every operator needs to implement and manage uh, in Golang. And in the case of Ansible, we've embedded uh, it into the Ansible operator SDK. And we'll more of that in, uh, in, in a moment here. Um, so let's take a look at what uh, 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 a Kubernetes operator with Ansible uh, looks like. So we're going back to a diagram that we'd just seen uh, a few slides back. So inside of an operator, we have this uh, operator SDK binary. And this is a pre-built generic operator that's written in Golang uh, that, that runs Ansible based on how you configure it in this watches.yaml file. Uh, that file represent a mapping between Kubernetes resource types uh, and events and your Ansible content. So uh, this is this is then then in your Ansible content, this is where you would use uh, your Cates module to um, you know create resources or modify resources on your Kubernetes cluster. So as a developer uh, creating a Kubernetes operator with Ansible, you are only responsible for providing that watches file and the Ansible content that manages your application. Everything else um, is brought to you. You get for free so to speak, um, as part of using the Ansible operator SDK. And we'll go over this in more depth um, in, the, in the next slide. But uh, you know, to go back to the operator binary, um, the, 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 the generic operator that comes as part of using the Ansible operator SDK, uh, all the low level operator functions and details are being handled for you. Uh, it, it, you know, using Go, it's a very powerful way to write operators, as, as I was just discussing, uh, but it, you know, it, it requires a, a number of advanced and complex, uh, the understanding of advanced uh, and complex concepts in doing so. And uh, you know, there's things that this generic operator, this, uh, the, the operator CK binary uh, brings like uh, advanced caching and queue management uh, that, that are uh, built into Go uh, and are available there for you to use, but we take care of that for you. So you don't have to have that, that knowledge and that expertise to be proficient with it um, and not bring your whole cluster down. Um, so the Ansible operator SDK um, um, you know, is providing that so you can focus on writing your reconciliation logic with Ansible and getting, getting things done. Uh, versus dealing with this um, more low-level um, um, functions and this, these generic operations. All right, so here's a deeper, more uh, detailed picture and what the operator with Danceful looks like, the interactions that happen there. We're going to spend a little bit of time on this one because it is, it is a, um, it's a, there's a fair bit of things going on here. So once you've deployed the operator and it reads in the watches.yaml file, uh, it begins monitoring uh, uh, things in the cluster uh, for looking for what has been defined in that file. Uh, when a matching event occurs, the operator SDK uh, binary then runs the Ansible automation using the input coming in from the CRD and, and from the cluster itself. Um, it's uh, the, the way that then this, the, the operator SDK binary works is that it's calling Ansible runner, uh, something we'll talk about in a moment, and then that's calling whatever your automation is, uh, whether it's playbooks or roles um, there. Uh, the operator SDK is providing additional services, as I've mentioned, that, that make things a lot easier, more convenient for you, more frictionless in writing these uh, uh, operators. So it's doing things like uh, it provides a reverse proxy that's taking calls in the API um, and uh, um, you know, help, helping you run this reconciliation logic. Uh, it's it doing various caching and embellishing of the calls, uh, like owner references to do proper garbage collection as a convenience. 
And then once all that, uh, uh, the Ansible automation is completed, your reconciliation logic has run, the uh, operator SDK binary takes the results of that run and then updates the status of the custom resource object in the Kubernetes um, um, management plane. All right, so that was a quick pass through all the interaction that, that's happening here. Um, I just wanna go back and um, drill down on a few extra things here. So um, as I mentioned that in addition to the, the spec, each object has a, a status. And this is an area where uh, the operator can put information about its understanding of the world right at that moment. And it can also be used when an operator runs to get uh, some idea of what's going on in the system. So one of the conveniences that the operator SDK binary does uh, or provides is it will automatically record the status of uh, and, and put some very useful things in there about what happened in the last run. This uh, uh, status that it writes for you is very similar to the Ansible playbook run, you know, what, what changes, errors, things like that. Uh, another thing that I mentioned uh, is the Ansible runner. So the Ansible, Ansible runner is a project that came out of the AWX project, which is the upstream to Ansible Tower. And that's a vehicle for running Ansible in a programmatic way uh, that's machine parsable and drivable. So the, the operator SDK binary makes use of that. Um, and it takes uh, events generated uh, uh, by Ansible runner and, uh, you know, it's what is being consumed by that um, by that service in, and and um, used to manage Ansible itself and do all that reporting. So that's that's how we bring those two together. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to to dive back into a little bit more is I mentioned about a reverse proxy for the API. Uh, I'm sorry, not for the API for the operator itself. So um, so when you're you're uh, 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 Ansible-based operator runs, uh, it, it does so in an environment that is actually configured to use this proxy service that then talks to the Kubernetes API on your behalf. And there's a couple of things that, the, that this does for you automatically that makes writing operators with Ansible uh, more frictionless. Uh, the first is that uh, it makes use of the of the cache. It does some very uh, um, um, aggressive, powerful caching um, there, and that's really important to Kubernetes to um, to have a good, solid, intelligent cache there interacting with the API because you you could very easily have hundreds of controllers running in your cluster if you, if, you know you have a large production environment going on and you really want to avoid unnecessarily hammering your API service so that it becomes overloaded and essentially in, you know, uh, create a denial of service on your own cluster and that you, you bring it down. So caching is very important and the operator SDK binary provides that for you transparently, seamlessly um, as you're working uh, just within Ansible using the case module. The other thing that this uh, service brings is that it manages owner references to garbage collection, for garbage collection, sorry. Uh, if you don't manage your uh, uh, owner references when you delete an object or a pod or something goes away, um, if you don't have the proper uh, owner references set up, Kubernetes doesn't know to clean these things, know that something's associated to clean it up, uh, and then you start you know, um, piling up trash inside of your Kubernetes cluster, essentially. So in order to make sure that that is, that is done, is done correctly, and to really, again, make it more uh, frictionless uh, and easier for you to do, uh, this reverse proxy service is adding that and embellishing the API calls to make sure that you have the proper owner references so that garbage collection works properly. Okay. All right, so let's talk about how you create an operator with Ansible. So we've covered all this good stuff. Let's let's finally get into the meat of it here. So it begins with the operator SDK, which is uh, you know freely available open source um, um, tool that's that's out there. Again, it is not um, it can be used with any Kubernetes 
uh, distribution. It is not uh, specifically and only tied to, for example, Red Hat, OpenShift, things of that, uh, like uh, any any commercial product like that. So to start a brand new uh, Ansible enabled operator project, you can use that tool to create it. Uh, when you when you run this command that you see here on the right, the new command, it scaffolds out a lot of the necessary and common files and even pre-populates it with all your metadata. So uh, like I said, the, what, what this will do, uh, this new command will do is it, it creates a skeleton Ansible role. It creates a watches.yaml mapping file for you. Uh, it, uh, it even creates some basic tests using Molecule, the, 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 the testing framework that uh, Ansible's adopted. Um, and it also creates the, uh, the, the, the CRD and other files for deploying your operator image. So with the project created then, we can get into the heart of our operator, the Ansible uh, uh, automation that will manage our application and perform the reconciliation logic. So in, in developing uh, your, your Ansible-based operator, you can apply the full complement of Ansible features, modules, and plugins. Uh, you know, that has a significant benefit to other forms of operators in that uh, you're, you're able to uh, use all that um, great functionality that comes with Ansible to do things, including managing off-cluster interactions like working with the resource in the cloud. So that's, that's possible in an area that we hope to um, uh, expand on in future iterations of this. So um, you can, uh, you know, you, you, you can take existing Ansible roles and they can be ported to operators. So uh, most Ansible playbooks and roles are for deploying and configuring a server or a VM. Uh, given the ephemeral and dynamic nature of containers and Kubernetes, best practices to uh, treat them, treat containers uh, or container images as immutable and have everything already baked into that image. So. Uh, Typically, an operator is going to be doing things like, uh, uh, you know, configuration of, you know, like a configuration map and um, setting up and configuring uh, other cluster resources and wiring together uh, what your application is doing with the world or and other microservices. So um, this is uh, why the, the Kate's module is so important and, and is, is what you will work with predominantly when writing uh, an operator with Ansible. Okay, so if you're familiar with developing Ansible automation, and I want to assume many of you are since this is an Ansible webinar, uh, the watches file is the one unique artifact that you need to create when you're developing an operator with Ansible. Uh, what happens is that this file is used by the operator SDK binary to map those Kubernetes cluster events, those, those uh, group version kinds, uh, uh, to your playbooks and roles that you've developed here. So what I'm showing on the screen here is an example, a, a, a simple example of a watches file for a single event to a single playbook. Um, so while I'm showing just one mapping, you can have multiple objects uh, that are being watched and specified in the watches file. Uh, there's a lot more things that you can specify in, in the watches file uh, but we're not going to cover that right now for uh, lack of time, uh, but it is in the uh, user guide of the uh, Ansible operator SDK. Uh, so moving right along, um, so the, the operator SDK is mapping standard Kubernetes resource structures to Ansible variables for you. Here on the left, we have a, a sort of deconstructed version of, the, um, of, of a resource definition. And we have, uh, you know, under the spec section, we have for, of the custom resource, uh, we have um, the key value pair data in there. And that, that the operator SDK binary is, takes those key value pairs and seamlessly passes them into Ansible when you run it as extra bars so that your, um, you know, your playbook or your role can access it in its automation. The other thing that of note there is the status. We've talked about that, and this is the the, the part that is automatically um, generated by the operator SDK. Um, you can put your own status information in there. There, there. That's a little bit of an advanced thing, but it is possible. We do provide 
that ability through a module called Tate Status that ships inside of the Ansible operator uh, SDK, so that it lets you write back that custom uh, status information you may need to write when the what the um, uh, operator SDK binary does uh, automatically for you when you need something a little more, something um, uh, uh, more specific. We have the ability to do that inside of Ansible. Uh, like I said, it's an advanced case. We're not going to be able to go into it here for lack of time, but it, it is out there, so be aware. Um, so let's take a moment here to take a look at um, what is in an Ansible operator image. Uh, what we have here is in the white box. This is what you provide, which is, is pretty minimal. I mean, we've already covered this. So you're, you're, you're creating the watches YAML file that we just talked about a bit earlier, and then at least one Ansible role or playbook. Uh, you can have multiples if you want, depending on what you're doing, how you want to manage, and things like that. But that white box is all that you need to be focused on uh, and concerned with and, and what you are responsible for doing. What's in the gray box, that's the functionality resources that are provided to you as part of the Ansible Operator SDK in its base image. So this includes the Operator SDK binary, that generic operator I've been talking about that, that, that wires a lot of the case API. Uh, up to your Ansible automation. Um, it, it also provides Ansible itself, Ansible Runner, and uh, uh, any Python libraries, and uh, I'm sorry, Python and any dependent libraries that you will need um, all come in this um, um, base image. So like, remember, you're only focused on that white box and you're getting everything in the gray box for free uh, by using the Ansible operator SDK. So once you've developed and tested your uh, operator and you're ready to go, the operator SDK makes the process of building your container image straightforward with the build command. This is actually, uh, the, the, the build command itself is pretty shallow um, and could be easily replicated, uh, but we're, we're just putting it there as a convenience to bring together the base image uh, um, and put your uh, Ansible automation in the right places and then create the container image um, that becomes your operator that you can now deploy to, uh, well, you could push it to an online registry such as uh, a key or as many people mispronounce Quay or any other uh, uh, container um, uh, registry out there that then you can pull it or you can deploy it to um, your Kubernetes cluster. So um, uh, once once we have our, our, our operator image ready, it's, it's good to go. Uh, you can then deploy your operator. You can create all the, the role-based access control, um, you know, role, role binding uh, objects, service account objects for the operator. You then create the um, custom resource definition for the operator. These are all really one-time steps when you first are introducing an operator to a cluster. Uh, I should mention some of these things you will not have to repeat every single time you want to deploy an operator. Uh, at that point, you can deploy the operator image to the cluster. Uh, and then once it's there, uh, you create a, a, a custom resource definition that initializes an instance of that operator. So, uh, uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's one, one thing to uh, um, highlight here is just by introducing the operator and, and, and creating a, a CRD for the operator, uh, you're not actually running the application, the, the operator, or I'm sorry, you're not, it will not start running your application. You have to create that custom resource um, um, in order to get the operator to spring into action and start deploying your application. Um, so once, one, once the operator's been initialized, it's just waiting um, for that to happen. Uh, okay, so moving on, we should also mention that, that we have uh, the Operator Hub IO. This is a, a home for the Kubernetes community uh, to share operators. There's a number of, of uh, operators already written, so you can go out there and use them today in Kubernetes um, and benefit from um, these, these reusable components should mention, and not all of these are Ansible uh, uh, based, and really to you, it doesn't matter. Uh, they could be written in Go, they could be using Helm charts. Uh, this this um, um, registry is uh, all open source and it is all ready for you to use right now. So I really 
recommend that you uh, check those out and explore uh, the operators, uh, what how they function and what you can do with them in your Kubernetes. Um, even if you're not going to be developing operators yourself, though I really hope you do after uh, listening to this and that you do them in Ansible. All right. So with that, I'm going to start wrapping up here. So for next steps, uh, you know, this is an Ansible webinar. I'm sure you all know about getting started and and uh, and community are probably very active already in Ansible and using Ansible in your day to day. Uh, for getting started with operators, the the uh, GitHub holds the operator framework project, and under that there is a a project called Getting Started that has a lot of more detailed documentation and examples for uh, writing operators, whether it's with Ansible or whether it's with Go and some of the other types we've talked about. For more information on, on the state of, of Ansible operators, we have the uh, operators page on ansible.com. Uh, it has a lot of great resources specific to Ansible uh, operators uh, up there. Uh, for the more technically inclined, we've also we also have a couple of suggestions for getting started with Ansible themselves. Uh, um, these aren't necessarily um, OpenShift uh, specific. Again, this is all very open and uh, um, uh, for the entire Kubernetes community. Um, so one one of the examples, and it's a great example of a sophisticated uh, Kubernetes operator using Ansible, is one written for etcd. This is not the actual uh, operator for etcd, but it was a proof of concept done by our team to see could they make a full featured operator um, um, that was done in Go and replicated um, using Ansible. So that's what resides here at this URL. For a more simple uh, um, example of, of writing uh, a, 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 an operator, we have a memcache one that's a uh, like I said, it's it's just a simple walkthrough um, that can help you get started with just the basics before you move on to something more sophisticated like what you see in etcd. All right, uh, with that, I just want to mention that uh, Ansible Fest is coming up. It's going to be September 24th to 26th. Tickets are on sale right now. If you go to ansible.com slash Ansible Fest, you know, all the information about the event in Atlanta uh, is there and how to buy uh, tickets. Uh, operators using Ansible will be uh, uh, a big topic of discussion at this year's Ansible Fest. Uh, we're, we're currently working through the talks and the agenda, um, but I can tell you that this will be something that you will be hearing a lot about at, uh, at Ansible Fest. So I really encourage you to come. It's been a great event uh, and it's a lot, a lot of great um, user interaction in the in the hallways and in the presentations and, and whatnot. And, and a lot of our engineers come out so you can talk to them directly um, and just learn about using Ansible better. So with that, uh, thank you for listening. And um, um, I can take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, just to let everybody know, the Ansible Fest pricing right now is super early bird. It's the lowest it's ever going to be. Um, so hit up ansible.com slash ansiblefest and get your tickets today. Uh, here's the thing, Tim. I don't see any questions. And I'm wondering in your control panel if you can see questions and this is some glitch or not. Yeah, uh, I yes. You, I'm not seeing any questions either. Okay. So this is not some I, go to webinar glitch. Uh, I'm I, totally okay with that. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, yes. Tim, what do you think the main advantage of writing operators in Ansible versus Go is? Uh, I think the, the, the advantage is the uh, lower barrier entry and the ability to iterate faster and, and make more effective use of your own resources uh, in that we're taking care of a lot of the, the things, the, the generic things that are harder um, to do properly in Kubernetes with Golang and making that frictionless so that you can get the automation done you need in your to managing your Kubernetes application uh, instead of having to deal with all this low level uh, stuff and and um, you know and, and and debugging it and working through all of that. So I, I think it's the, the same Ansible 
value proposition we see in traditional IT application stacks is we're bringing that over here into um, the Kubernetes world, the cloud native world. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I still don't see any questions. I appreciate yeah. the answer to mine. And uh, let's just wrap it up. How about that? So yeah, thank you everyone for joining good. us today. And uh, Tim, thank you for presenting on this awesome topic that I'm super fond yeah. of. And happy, automa uh, happy automating, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, everyone.